Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chanel, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we're pleased to introduce internationally recognized expert in integrative medicine, Dr. Andrew Heyman, and founder of Four Directions Wellness, Mara Benner. In this webinar, they'll cover stress management and social isolation during COVID-19. They'll stop at the end of their presentation to address any questions you may have. Please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box of your control panel at any time during the presentation. To our panelists, thank you for joining us today. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I think this topic is timely and important, just reviewing the basics of stress um, and how to cope with uh, stressful conditions uh, of COVID since many of us are still sequestered at home. Um, <clears throat> I would like to take a moment though and um, re-announce uh, the establishment of a, of a relationship between George Washington University uh, and A4M once again in partnership around our master's degree program in integrative medicine. Uh, for those of you who, ha who haven't heard, uh, we now have a master's of science in health sciences through the Department of Health Sciences at George Washington University um, in integrative medicine. And it's a 36 credit hour, uh, fully online graduate degree program uh, that um, confers a, a master's degree um, in health sciences. Um, for the physicians uh, that are interested, it's one of the only routes now available uh, to be able to become board eligible for the new American Board of um, Integrative Medicine through the American Board of Physician Specialties. This is a real innovation in the field uh, insofar as uh, it offers for the first time uh, credentialing through um, uh, a, an American recognized uh, board. And uh, right now there's only a few programs that qualify uh, to become board eligible and even fewer that are online uh, let alone end with a master's degree. We're really the only one in that regard. Uh, to that end, uh, we're reestablishing this relationship with A4M because uh, GW values the education that's offered and understands that it's of a very high caliber, uh, quite evidence-based and academically oriented. So for those individuals that have either registered or completed five MMI fellowship modules, um, you can receive a 10% tuition discount uh, for the master's degree program. We only have 10 slots uh, for this uh, tuition discount for the fall, and I think we've already filled almost half of them. So if there's anybody listening that is interested in completing a master's and ultimately sitting for the um, Board of Integrative Medicine, this is really probably the best route uh, for you, and uh, certainly nice to get a pretty significant tuition discount. Uh, if you're interested, please contact uh, Liz Wheeler. Uh, this is her email and phone number. Uh, she will get you organized and uh, moving in the GW direction uh, should you have an interest in uh, completing the master's degree. So uh, I'm very excited about that relationship. I think it's really special and important that uh, we have it. So uh, today's topic is uh, reviewing some aspects of stress. I think we all experience it and we experience it in different ways. Um, Today, I'll speak briefly about its impact on the body, um, where it typically finds itself in terms of a physiologic response, and then some um, key interventions on what to do about it. And then the next half of the session today will be offered by Mara Benner, um, who uh, is from Four Directions Wellness and also uh, connected to the George Washington University too. Um, so, you know, I like this quote because I feel like stress is one of these sort of summary uh, concepts that invokes sort of that mind, body, spirit connection. Uh, within the body itself, it ends up being a very complex set of uh, bodily reactions. Um, and we're still learning about the details and intricacy by which uh, the body sort of arranges itself around stress at every level. Uh, from the organ and tissue all the way down to the cellular and subcellular, cellular, uh, genetic, genomic, and epigenetic. Um, so I like this quote because it tends to encapsulate uh, this notion of as we put these pieces together, we're getting closer and closer to truth. Uh, this was written by Fouad Lachine, is a very famous uh, neuroscientist who was uh, nominated for the Nobel uh, Prize uh, in the early 2000s for his work 
uh, in brain chemistry in particular and its relationship to the set of the body, um, to the set of um, other organ systems. So he writes, a human being is much more than the sum of uh, blood, bone, and viscera. In the same way, each fragment of truth in itself is a lie. Uh, therefore, the accumulation of unintegrated scientific facts does not protect us against ignorance. In the measure that we interrelate a greater number of fragments, the closer we can come to truth, although truth as an absolute is unattainable. And it's this notion that we keep collecting all this information and, and trying to understand sort of the full uh, pattern of um, complexity that we see in an organized stress response, even just on the physiologic level, let alone sort of its connection to mind and spirit. In this sense of pattern analysis, it actually is bringing us away from sort of standard medicine and trying to look at the body through a systems biology perspective. And so, uh, you know, we have these different frames of reference and sometimes it's that frame shift uh, that's really provocative and opens new doors of inquiry and insight. Um, I think stress is a nice frame to begin to make that frame shift for us. So what is the definition of stress? It's a state of threatened homeostasis that is reestablished by complex repertoire, physiologic and behavioral adaptive responses of the organism. We're meant to react to stress. We're meant to respond to it in positive ways. Um, and in fact, it's, it's a, um, uh, pressure or load that either builds accommodation and builds resiliency and capacity, but also potentially threatens that homeostasis and can lead to breakdown uh, in various aspects of our health. So part of that notion of um, the resiliency that's sort of built into our physiology is this term allostasis, which was coined many years ago, but, but used primarily by a wonderful uh, physiological psychologist, uh, Bruce McEwen, and it's the ability to achieve stability through change, which is critical to survival. And that the complex mechanisms of the stress system um, include not just the autonomic nervous system and the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, but also the HPA axis proper, the cardiovascular and metabolic systems, and the immune system. Then we have this load, we have threats to the stress response. And this load uh, can create adaptations and countermeasures within our physiology, but sometimes the price of that accommodation can create wear and tear, and we can see ultimately a breakdown in these compensatory mechanisms where we see either overactivity or underactivity of that load. And of course, stressors come in all forms. It doesn't have to be just emotional um, or psychological. It can be even spiritual in terms of loss of meaning and purpose. And it certainly can be chemical and biological as well. In the concept of how we react to stress, that occurs on a couple levels. One is behavioral and the other is physiologic. So as we perceive stress, we have these built-in mechanisms by which we respond, either through fight or flight, which leads to sort of personal behaviors and choices, which are adaptive or maladaptive. But we have this underlying physiologic stress response that can also be adaptive or maladaptive depending on the uh, predisposition of, of the individual, which is often mediated by those individual differences. Under normal circumstances, we can have a stressor or a threat to the system and uh, the entire stress response upregulates in meaningful ways. And then once the stressor uh, disappears, those combined mechanisms should return to normal. But we can have lack of adaptation, so an attrition of the stress response. We can also have prolonged responses where you have one stressor and then the body remains upregulated even though the stressor is gone. But over time, we can have this sort of ultimately inadequate stress response, which means um, a more permanent loss of adaptation. There are lots and lots and lots of symptoms that are associated with the um, abnormalities of the stress response that are measurable, whether it's increased HPA axis or decrease HPA axis, they're often very similar. Most of the literature would say though that once you get decrease in activity, um, that's a more dire sign, that overall clinical outcomes are worse and the associated symptoms and illnesses and conditions that go along with decrease activity are much harder to treat and more resistant to our therapies overall. So there is an evolution 
that we see occurring, especially just through the lens of cortisol production, where in earlier times of stress, we have hypercortisolism, so cortisol is overly expressed, and we get these alterations throughout the body as a compensatory set of mechanisms to help buffer and countermeasure against those elevated cortisol uh, states. So we can see, as a reaction, reduced biosynthesis or release of central mediating compounds and hormones. We can see hypersecretion of secretagogues with downregulation of target receptors, almost like a cortisol uh, resistance pattern. Um, enhanced sensitivity to negative feedback of cortisol, so that's centrally and brain related. Decreased availability of cort free cortisol, so cortisol binding globulin goes up, and then reduced effects of cortisol on the target tissue. So if you think about this, as the body is going through these changes, there are these deep alterations in the balance of the stress response that ultimately can lead to this, quote, hypocortisol state. So in the literature, we don't really talk about adrenal fatigue, mostly because low cortisol is a function of these deeper alterations that have very little to do with the adrenal glands. In fact, there are very few cortisol receptors in the adrenals themselves. Um, when we see a hypocortisol state, we have to think more broadly about, well, how did the person get there? And so not only do we see these peripheral alterations, but the centrally mediated ones are probably even more important. And it really begins with cortisol's impact on the brain, where cortisol tends to trigger uh, specialized macrophages in the brain called microglial cells. So we see overexpression of these neurotoxic compounds as the brain becomes more and more hyperexcited under states of stress. In the early phases, this is okay. This is what creates hypervigilance. It improves short-term memory. It allows us to um, react quickly to stressors. But over time, if the stress continues and cortisol levels remain elevated, we begin to see the damage and ravages of stress on the brain itself, most of which is either mediated through microglial activation or the direct effect of cortisol on brain tissue because it's a catabolic hormone. So in later stages of stress, we can see alterations in key areas of the brain that concentrate cortisol receptors. The highest area is the hippocampus itself, which is the main crossroads of the stress response. It has more cortisol receptors than any other area of the brain, and it acts as a regulator for the HPA axis. So the hippocampus then plays dual roles. It is important for consolidating short-term memory and assigning emotions to memory but it also, on a more physiologic level, acts as the break to the stress response. So as the hippocampus becomes excited under high states of cortisol, it helps to downregulate HPA activity. Over time, though, unfortunately, cortisol and localized inflammation can end up damaging the hippocampus, which is some of the earliest signs of brain-related changes tied to emotional trauma and a strong signal that the brain is becoming injured as a result of excess stress. What happens then as a result of the repeated effects of stress on the brain is we begin to see alterations in both structure and function, not just of the hippocampus, but also of the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the locus ceruleus. Over time, we see nuclear atrophy or volume loss in the hippocampus in particular, which we know has been associated with PTSD, atypical or treatment resistant depression, uh, and Cushing syndrome. This is all typically led by high concentrations of cortisol and activation of those NMDA receptors by glutamate, so you have high neuroexcitation. And as a result, phenotypically, individuals tend to report um, loss of verbal memory and mem um, uh, re recall of, of uh, important memories, as well as loss of regulation of the HP axis itself. Ultimately, over time, the brain says enough is enough, and it begins to turn down the HPA axis. This is one of the last ditch efforts that the brain has to protect itself and the rest of the body from ongoing stress. So interestingly, it's actually a positive adaptation. So when we see alterations and hypoactivity in the stress response, it's a signal that the body and brain has become overwhelmed and that we have to um, not only appreciate the, the magnitude of that phenomenon, but also think more clearly about, well, how do we intervene? So we know that um, stress can basically accelerate aging um, at every level of the body, and it's important for us to intervene appropriately, but where to intervene. And, you know, from, from a clinical model, I think in terms of the system biology perspective of beginning to 
knit together what are the areas that are participatory in the stress response and where are the vulnerabilities? Well, ultimately it's a brain on fire phenomenon with a risk of neurodegeneration and structural changes. And so the question becomes, well, how do we stall the stress response and protect it? And how do we encourage uh, the brain to heal? At the same time that this is occurring, stress has a big impact on the immune system. So we know when cortisol levels are high, the immune system tends to be suppressed. Over time, if cortisol levels are suppressed, if the body is in this hypocortisol state, it releases the immune system, and we know individuals have a higher baseline level of inflammation, which is even worse for outcomes. So we have two areas of physiology that tend to change in very meaningful ways under times of stress. We can see these brain-related changes, both in function and structure, and we can see alterations in immune activity. If cortisol is suppressed and the immune system is released, we can see a higher predisposition to autoimmune diseases, a higher risk for cancer and worse outcomes in cancer, and a higher risk of diseases associated with chronic inflammation. So a lack of adaptation and a, a hypocortisol state is ultimately and potentially a disaster for the patient. And the model then becomes as cortisol levels fall, systemic inflammation levels rise. We know that there's excess microglial activation in the brain. This also leads to serotonin degradation, especially in the digestive tract, and patients begin to report nonspecific symptoms of sickness, which is fatigue, uh, lack of coping to new stressors, uh, and often pain-related syndromes. So how do we know that this is occurring? Well, blood is really not a great um, tissue sample for cortisol in particular because it tends to overestimate the levels that are present. Saliva is a much better tool. It's non-invasive, it's stress-free, um, it's quite reliable. And we can also see the full pattern of cortisol production over the course of a day. There are normal patterns and there are abnormal patterns. So a normal pattern of cortisol production is high in the morning and lower throughout the rest of the day unless there's a stressor and then cortisol levels go up. When a person is under high states of stress, we can see elevated cortisol with flattening of their response over the course of a day. Um, this is hypervigilance. It's uh, typical depression. It's treatment sensitive depression. It's suppression of the immune system, but the patient by definition is now also in a catabolic state. They're probably engaging in behaviors to deal with their stress, and this is adaptive, but if, if um, we don't see a resetting of this physiologic response back to normal, this then over time begins to be the engine of change in the peripheral target uh, tissue receptors as well as uh, the central nervous system. When we begin to see mixed patterns of cortisol production, we begin to infer that those alterations are beginning to take hold, usually functional changes in the hippocampus, upregulation of cortisol binding globulin, disposition of cortisol uh, through peripheral mechanisms as well. And ultimately, we can see flattening of the cortisol curve, which is sort of the worst version, the worst form, uh, both symptomatically, phenotypically, and also for clinical outcomes. We know that individuals who have concurrent illness and hypocortisol states have the worst outcomes. So whether it's a breast cancer patient, a cardiovascular patient, a diabetes patient, a depressed patient, they tend to respond less to uh, biological therapies. And also they have worse outcomes overall compared to uh, patients that also have the same disease but no flattening of the cortisol curve. So how do we deal with this? How do we protect the brain? How do we offer um, therapeutic interventions that are meaningful on the biological level? Well, when cortisol levels are elevated, I tend to like magnolia and philodendron. This is a very reliable combination of botanicals, which has specifically been shown in multiple human trials uh, to normalize high cortisol and raise low DHEA. And the typical dose is one capsule uh, three times a day. Uh, many of you probably also like theanine. Theanine is a green tea extract. Um, it has very nice anti-anxiety effects. It's an analog of glutamate. It's protective against the neuroexcitatory effects of, uh, of both glutamate, um, and it stabilizes the NMDA bridges uh, to prevent calcium influx into the neuron. It also directly reduces norepi levels and therefore blood pressure 
and it even blocks the effects of caffeine. Plus, theanine is um, actually quite reliable. So, in addition to that, um, I like um, uh, dosing between two and four hundred milligrams, two to three times a day, um, and up to twelve hundred milligrams of theanine itself. Uh, Finally, to get a little more fancy, when you think about the herbal adaptogens uh, that have been used for centuries for stress, ginseng, ashwagandha, rhodiola. What's interesting about all of them is that they're quite unique in that, yes, they buffer the stress response, but they do that very specifically through protecting the brain. When you look at where the ginsengs of the world really operate, it's in the central nervous system, and they help to reduce neuroexcitation, they reduce neuroinflammation, they help to reset the stress response. No wonder this category of botanicals was considered so special in just about every herbal tradition around the world. Now we're getting relatively fancy in understanding, well, what are the components of these herbs that are even more neuroprotective? And out of Chinese ginseng, uh, the School of Pharmacy in Beijing isolated and identified certain ginsenicides that are particularly uh, protective. And these are the, um, the RG lines. And there's RG1, RG2, RG3, and there's also RB. So there's RB1, RB2, RB3. RG3 in particular seems to be the most neuroprotective of all the ginsenicides because it's quite sedating to microglial activation. It directly reduces inflammation in the brain. It also stabilizes that NMDA receptor, just like theanine does, but in a more potent way. Um, And you can do it either orally or taken as a nasal spray. The nasal spray dose is even more effective. It's two milligrams per ml. Um, And I use this all the time in my patients uh, who have significant stress, neuroinflammatory processes, neurodegeneration, concussion, stroke, any kind of head trauma. It really is almost miraculous in its ability to protect against stressors of all sorts against the brain tissue. And we always combine it with nicotinamide riboside, which is a vitamin B3 derivative that directly raises NAD levels in brain tissue, which helps with the repair process. Now, NAD has been under very high uh, scrutiny and research at Harvard since the early 2000s. And nicotinamide as the direct precursor is really wonderful at raising NAD levels in the brain because it too is so neuroprotective and I like to call it brain food. You can do nicotinamide riboside orally, 250 to 500 milligrams daily, or you can do it as a nasal spray as well. And I typically combine them, combine the RG3 and the nicotinamide into a single uh, compound. Finally, I like plant sterilins. We've talked about these before in prior COVID lectures uh, because of their immunomodulating capacity. They help buffer CD4 cells. They balance Th1, Th2. And sort of by definition, when people are under high states of stress, they have immune shifts that have to be occurring. And so I tend to like to add in some immunomodulators like plant sterilins that work on the other side of that stress coin, which is the immune system. And so by adding in some plant sterilins, I can get some nice balancing of CRP, um, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and help to correct a Th1, Th2 uh, picture. Uh, So I'll do typically 20 milligrams three times a day for 60 days, and then twice a day thereafter. So in conclusion, uh, stress response is tightly integrated with the nervous system, the endocrine, cardiovascular, and immune systems. Flattened cortisol curve may be adaptive, despite the metabolic and clinical implications. And for me, my clinical strategy is to seek the primary causative factors for stress, um, offer behavior and lifestyle interventions, which Mara's going to talk about a bit, and then have appropriate selection of natural products and medications to help rebalance that complex by protecting the brain, buffering the immune system, and working on the sources of stress uh, in the individual. So thanks so much for your attention. That was a quick overview of sort of the biology of the stress response. Um, and then I want to turn it over to uh, my friend, Mar Benner, um, associated uh, with um, uh, George Washington University, who's going to speak on uh, mindful, mindfulness and the role of mind um, in stress as well. Thank you, Dr. Heyman. Um, unfortunately, your sound went out for just about 30 seconds or so while you were going over the Magnolia, I believe uh- it was, slide and the dosing okay. slide. So I was wondering if you could recap on that for us, please. Sure. So Magnolia phalodendron is a standardized extract um, of two botanical compounds that's particularly good for elevated cortisol in particular. And the standardized dose, therefore, is one capsule three times a day. 
It helps to normalize high cortisol and low DHEA. There's a number of human studies um, on this particular combination, and it works really well uh, in partnership with the theanine. So I think of the magnolia philodendron as sort of a natural antidepressant, and the theanine is my natural benzo. Excellent, thank you. Now we're switching gears and we're gonna have Mara Benner present. Hello everyone. Let me just get this, oops. Hello everyone, thank you Dr. Heyman and it's such a, pro, um, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. So um, as Dr. Heyman mentioned, my name's Mara Benner and I also have the privilege of being the mind, body, spirit practitioner for the GW Center for Integrative Medicine. And today what I'm hopeful to do is to talk a little bit about, as a practitioner myself, what I am doing to help clients make the connection between mind, body, and spirit overall. And would love to do one meditation today of how I begin that journey with that individual. And so we'll do a meditation in just a moment. Um, I'm also going to just briefly talk a little bit about whole person care and some of the studies that kind of influence how I work with those clients. So here you'll see healthcare paradigm shift. This was a Wall Street Journal article that said, in the future, Americans will be healthier because our healthcare system will treat us as whole persons. That is the artificial separations between physical, behavioral, and mental health care will have disappeared. And this is what I'm really looking at when I'm starting to work with a client primarily who has a chronic illness or other type of situation where we want to explore at a deeper level what might be happening and to help them resonate with that. And of course, from a spiritual perspective, it may not be religious, but it's about checking in and connecting with them on what their passions or creativity aspects are wanting to be explored as well. But all of these come into the consideration as we work through it. Um, Dr. Heyman talked a lot about stress, but I just wanna mention a few things. Obviously with COVID, we're in a different realm right now. Um, this was a study by the American Psychological Association from 2017, but still resonates with the clients that I'm working with. Obviously, we know that as COVID has started, you have about four to six weeks where the individuals may be in a bit of shock and trying to determine a new routine. So we are starting to come out of that phase and we know that a lot more emotional aspects may be seen at this time. So we're becoming very aware of that as we start to work with our clients and patients. But some of the top things that the American Psychological Association found was stress related to the future of our nation, money, work. And you can certainly um, understand that that's still on the minds of individuals as they go through with COVID. What the same study found was the way that this is showing up physically on the body. And so I'm helping when I'm working with a client to start to make that connection of where is that particular stress showing up for them and then doing a deeper dive into that area for their own personal exploration. Likewise, I wanted to just briefly mention this study. This was from the Commonwealth Fund and it just took place. This was for senior citizens and it looked at social isolation and really found that one in four adults um, is recognizing that um, feeling of isolation and it is impacting their physical and mental health overall. So we know that they are feeling um, more social isolation and it's having an impact on their chronic um, conditions. So important to kind of recognize that too. Great, okay. so. Part of this is knowing that there's these different techniques that can be applied to help individuals. When I'm working with them, I know that each technique is very unique to them. So really have to identify, do they like more physical aspects like Tai Chi, Qigong, or are they okay with doing meditation? And maybe it's a combination of some of these techniques. This was from a study by the American Hospital Association. They found that about 40% of responding hospitals are starting to adopt different alternative approaches to helping their patients 
start to make those connections with the mind and body. And I am an avid supporter of learning more about ancient healing techniques. I love the fact that they go back to different countries and that really every culture has had its own way of providing that homeostasis. And so this is just an explanation and a showing for the different types that are out there. But of course, the list goes on and on. It's just fascinating to know that there's so many different cultures who have ways of approaching the mind-body-spirit connection. Okay, so when we work with individuals, again, it's about connecting with them, how they are working with their own personal self-care and to identify those passions and how they create to be able to help with that spiritual component. So when I work with medical residents or, or others that I'm training on, including my clients, I am walking through to help them identify these types of techniques that they can incorporate and help with their overall healthcare. I also work with the American Chronic Pain Association. What's interesting from their perspective is that of course they want their membership to be able to receive medical attention and to be able to get on a treatment plan for their pain. And then they're interested in really helping their membership do a deeper dive into what else is taking place. And so they're encouraging us to help as practitioners um, the individual kind of redefine from away from pain and start to reframe their story as to what else might be beneficial for them as they move forward, recognizing that the pain may still be there. So I think there's a lot of the um, uh, Ill illness or associations related to chronic pain and other chronic illnesses that recognize that they need to be working with their membership to help this exploration as well. And I have several ways of helping and supporting you and also clients with different meditation apps. And the one that most clients love is Insight Timer and it's down below, but a lot of these are free and able to be used for the exploration. And what I'd like to do now is to help you with your own meditation and to walk us through maybe a 10 to 15 minute meditation to explore this. And this again is like the first layer that we would be doing with a client or a patient. And so what I'd encourage you to do is a couple of things. We're working from home. So if you're able to find a place that's comfortable and to the extent possible, a bit quiet, that would be wonderful. I want to help with that mind, body, spirit, stress reduction kind of connection. So I'd encourage you to think for just a moment before we start this meditation about first uh, your number one stress that you're having in your life and also identify a second stress. So just take a moment to think about those. And once identified, let's just take a moment to get comfortable. As we start with breathing, we're, I'm going to ask that you take a deep breath in all the way down to your belly. And as you're able, then you're going to be releasing. And we're going to explore both those uh, two stresses that you have. So just come in for a moment, becoming relaxed, comfortable, dedicating this time for yourself. And we start with the breath. So go ahead and take a deep cleansing breath in. Exhaling and releasing, letting go. Just continuing that nice rhythmic breath in and out. The breath is how we come into the present moment, so it helps anchor us in the present. Wonderful, and then we're going to just ask that you draw your awareness down to your feet. Take a moment just to check in with your feet sensing or noticing comfort, discomfort, maybe no sensation at all. And then go ahead and squeeze the muscles of your feet together and then release, letting go.
letting go. And then come up to your shins and your calf. Just checking in here, drawing your awareness. Just noticing if there's any discomfort or tension. And go ahead and squeeze the muscles of your shins together and the calves and then release, letting go. And come up to your thighs. Checking in with your thighs. Go ahead and squeeze your thighs together and release. Letting go. Go ahead and take another deep cleansing breath in. Releasing and letting go. And then come up to your abdomen. Just checking in with any sensations here. Go ahead and squeeze the muscles of your abdomen together and release, letting go, letting go. And just drawing your awareness up to your shoulders, sensing or noticing this area. Go ahead and move your shoulders up towards your ears and gently back down and around, releasing and letting that go. You might want to do that once again, just drawing your shoulders up to your ears and back down and around, releasing and letting go. Good. And then just drawing your awareness down to your hands. Sensing or feeling into them. Go ahead and make a fist with your hands and then release. Letting go. And go ahead and take another deep cleansing breath in, all the way down to your belly if you're able, and then exhale releasing and letting go. And bring your awareness now up to the jaw. Just checking in with the jaw and gently moving it to the left and to the right, releasing and letting go. And then coming up to your forehead, you often hold a lot of attention to in the forehead. And when you're ready, go ahead and squeeze your forehead together and release, letting go. And go ahead and take another deep cleansing breath in and then release, letting go. So as you continue to stay in that meditative state, we're going to bring your awareness to that number one stress that you are experiencing in your life. So just bringing your awareness to it. Noticing any feelings any thoughts about the issue or person. And our physical bodies are team players with us. So that stress is sometimes held physically in the body and our body is asking us just to bring our awareness to that. So as you focus on that first stress, I want you now to ask your body to show you where this stress resides on you physically. Where is it?
You may notice a sensation, maybe an ache or a pain. And for some people, they simply just know where it's being held on their body. You don't need to second guess, but rather go with the first indication that you receive. And it may be in two different places in your body. Take a moment just to go to the first spot. I want you to draw your awareness now to that first place on your body. Really becoming aware of it. As you draw your awareness there, notice if you're sensing more tension or pain. The intensity may change over time as you're paying attention. So just sensing or noticing. As you do, you may find that you get an image or colors or maybe additional feelings or emotions get presented. Just become aware. You can just act as a witness as your body provides that information to you. And maybe you're not receiving any information at all, but just know where it is on your body. So once you've received the information, let your body know that you'll continue to listen to it, but it's time now to release it. So with your next breath in, breathe into the place on your body where you're holding the stress, and as you exhale, I want you to envision that you're releasing whatever sensations, whatever came up, just letting it go. You may even see it as a gray mist leaving. And then breathe in again, clean, new energy. And again, releasing and letting go of whatever that stress is, letting it go. And you just continue to breathe in and out, releasing and letting it go. And we'll do this once again now. Now that that's been released, Let's now identify that second stress. Feeling or sensing the issue or person. Now asking your physical body to show you where this stress resides on you. Where is it? Identify it. It may be a very subtle sensation. Or you might just know where it is. And if you're able to identify it, now go to that particular area on your body. Just going deeper into it.
Focusing on the sensations. Noticing if there's an intensity to it and if that changes over time. Just become aware of the sensations, the feelings, emotions, maybe images, colors, whatever arrives for you. Just being aware of that. And now that your body has provided you with that message, we can now let the body know that we've heard it and it may be released. So with your next breath in, breathing into that part of your body, letting it go with the exhalation, releasing it. And continuing that process of breathing in new energy into that part of the body, and then releasing Letting it go, letting go of that stress. And then just check in with your body one last time, just to notice if there's been a change from when we started the meditation. I'm just noticing what changes that might be. You can come back by wiggling your fingers, wiggling your toes, and gently starting to come back in by opening your eyes. And if you have a moment, just jotting down whatever impressions you may have received. This is a way to begin to connect the mind-body and to understand the messaging and to be able to help an individual move forward on their personal journey. I also just want to mention that for anyone that may have had something come up during that meditation, if you need someone to speak to, feel free to give me a call as well. I want to make sure that um, you know you feel comfortable with that meditation. And I also want to provide you with this. I train medical students and talk to them about how metaphorically there are aspects to what is taking place from an ailment and a disease perspective. And this is a wonderful comprehensive book that goes into the metaphorical meanings. So I often allow my clients to hear the metaphorical meaning and to see what resonates for them. And that's another layer to helping to connect everything for that individual. So that's a good, wonderful thing as well. And here's my contact information. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciated the opportunity to be with you today, and I'll pass it now back to Dr. Heyman. Great, thanks, Mara. Thank you, Mara and, Dar uh, and Dr. Heyman. Wonderful. So we have a little bit of time before we have to close if there's any questions. Our first question today, where do you get RG3? Good question, so any PCCA pharmacy uh, should be able to compound it for you. It um, You can order it under the name Synapsin, S-Y-N-A-P-S-I-N, Synapsin, and they'll know the, the concentration and dosing. Um, so the way to write the prescription is Synapsin, two sprays per nostril twice a day. So it's four sprays twice a day total. Thank you. I will allow about 10 more seconds for anyone to get their questions in. Again, you can type your question into the chat box of your control panel at any time. Uh, this question is for Mara. Could you please repost the book that was mentioned last about conditions and their psychological correspondences? Absolutely. And, yeah. I don't know that I can get back to the slide, but let me just tell you that the book's name is The Complete Dictionary 
of Ailments and Diseases, and it's by Jacques Martel. Excellent, thank you. And that seems to be all of the questions that we have for today. Great.